Thank you all for coming. And it's excellent to be here um, at this uh, Liberal Democrat History Group meeting. Um, and we're going to talk, um, as you know, about one of the great conundrums in British political history. Uh, I've already been beaten about the head by Vernon for quite a long time. So, <laughs> um, But the question is, how could a party that in 1906 won more than 48% of the vote then slumped in less than 20 years to under 20% and then by 1935 to barely 3% of the vote. That was the year, 1935, when George Dangerfield first published The Strange Death of Liberal England. And it's a tribute to his journalistic phrase making, if not to his historical accuracy, that his <laughs> arguments have never been quite conclusively answered. Tonight, we're very fortunate to have two of the best placed historians to, in Britain to consider this question. Vernon Bognor is going to be familiar to all of you, I'm sure, because he's the go-to man for broadcasters and the press and politicians on all questions relating to 20th century political and constitutional and governmental developments and disputes. For years, he was um, professor of government at Oxford, and now he's a research professor at the Centre for British Politics and Government at King's College London. I once heard him say that uh, David Cameron was the cleverest undergraduate no, he ever no, no, I did, I did. Historical I did. accuracies. I said one of the ablest and nicest students I have taught. You can never say of anyone that he's the cleverest. That's weird. No, I've never said that about well, anyone. <laughs> Unless I'd have had you as a student. That, then it would have been different. I said he was one of the ablest and nicest. And I'm often misquoted on that. I well, stick by what I said, incident. For obvious reasons, this year, Burnham was knighted for services to political science. Oh, David <laughs> which is a recognition that many of us will consider <laughs> long overdue. <laughs> Burnham's just published a, a close re-examination of the Dangerfield thesis, the strange survival of liberal Britain, politics and power before the First World War. I think he may be available to sign copies of his book after our discussion. Joining us remotely is Richard Toy, Professor of History at um, Exeter University and a specialist in 20th century history with a particular interest in Churchill, feminist history and rhetoric. He's just finished a book on Attlee, The Age of Hope, which I think Richard will be published later this year. And uh, <laughs> Richard's going to ask why we're still arguing about Dangerfield, uh, an argument that was considered flawed at the time and is now nearly 100 years old. But first, Bernard. Thank you. Well, thanks to the Liberal Democrat History Group for inviting me to speak. But I have to begin with two health warnings. Uh, the first was, is that I'm not talking about strange survival of the Liberal Party. And Dangerfield wasn't talking about the strange death of the Liberal Party, but of a Liberal culture, which he thought died in 1914, I think has not died in 1940 and still survives, even dare I say it, in the the second warning is that the is, a lot of the book is of course about the Liberal Party and its reforms before the First World War. But the Liberal Party was very different from what it became, say, after the Second World War, or the Liberal Democrats now. I'm sure many of you are familiar with the story of Rip Van Winkle, who uh, goes to sleep in America for a number of years and there's a local pub called the George. And when he goes to sleep, the pub has a picture of George III. But when he wakes up many years later, it has a picture of George Washington. It's a very different animal. And the Liberal Party then was a very different animal. And I put it in two ways. Firstly, they favored single chamber government. They did not want and it certainly did not want an elected House of Lords, having had so much trouble with a hereditary House of Lords, they didn't want to be replaced by one which would have much more legitimacy than um, the hereditary chamber. And they put in the preamble only to satisfy one or two people, a minority led by Sir Edward Grey, the Foreign Secretary, who believed Britain would not accept single chamber government, where well, we have now for 110 years. Secondly, the Liberals were very strongly in favour of the first-past-the-post electoral system, which had yielded them a wonderful majority in 1906 on a comparatively small percentage of the vote. And uh, Asquith, in 1908, established a royal commission to inquire into the electoral system, the only one we've ever had, 
And um, evidence was given for it by a man called J. Rennick Seeger, who was secretary of the registration department of the Liberal Central Association. He said, proportional representation is a matter scarcely ever talked about. The liberal agents as a whole, so far as I know, are none of them in favor of it. And as to the organizations, I do not know one liberal organization that has ever passed a resolution in favor of it. And as I say, they'd won a majority of 397 seats out of 670 in the Commons in 1906 on just 49% of the vote. Now, under proportional representation, that have had to depend on the Irish party for their majority, which they'd done in 1892 with not very happy results. And the strongest opponents of proportional representation were successive liberal leaders, Gladstone, Asquith, and Lloyd George. And I don't know if it's a coincidence or not, Gladstone and Asquith, not Lloyd George, were also the strongest opponents of female suffrage. Now, um, the a book was written to look at how liberal Britain responded to very fundamental challenges when her political system and global supremacy were under challenge. The obvious challenge, Britain was moving from aristocratic to a democratic system, and outsiders, trade unionists and women, were clamoring to get in. There was an ideological challenge to what you might call traditional liberalism, the small state and non-intervention abroad. And as early as 1887, the William Harcourt, Chancellor of the Exchequer and a later Liberal government, said, we are all socialists now. And people were moving towards planning. And Joseph Chamberlain, a renegade Liberal, uh, it came, as, as you know, to call for the end of free trade. But the important point is that the economy became part of a political debate, which it hadn't been in the 19th century. In the 19th century, people thought that Westminster and the economy were in two separate spheres and neither could influence the other. But in the 20th century, they came together. Most, much of Pop is about managing the economy. In the 19th century, the issues were primarily constitutional and religious. In the 20th century, I mean, sadly, for the sale of my books, they aren't, they're economic and social. And the social question came into British politics as well. And when uh, William Beveridge, later author of the famous report, and of course, a liberal member briefly of the House of Lords and, and of the House of Commons, an MP, a liberal MP for about a year, uh, he was told by the master of his Oxford College, when you've learned all that Oxford can teach you, you have to answer the question of why so many in such a rich society are still very poor. And people began to believe that inequalities were not divinely ordained. And then there was a global challenge from the United States and Germany, which overtaken Britain in steel production, and in Germany in particular, threatening the British Empire. And Chamberlain's idea of shadow reform was really to bind the empire together into a large economic unit, rather as the idea of the economic union, sorry, the European Union, is to bind Europe together in a large unit so as to be able to talk more or less equally to America. And uh, the argument is America uh, can treat Europe with disdain because it's so fragmented, which I think is on the whole true. And my answer to the question of how Britain reacted is the strength of her liberal institutions, commitment to parliamentary debate, and so on, pulls her through. And um, most of the difficult problems were dealt with. The House of Lords problem was dealt with. Eventually, female suffrage was dealt with. The trade unions were gradually being incorporated, and Lloyd George can originate in this, incorporate into state. And I take the view that this is where Richard Torrey disagrees with me in an otherwise generous review in the, I think it was a BBC History magazine. Even Ireland, I think, was on the way to solution by 1914. So what liberal ideology could not deal with, I think, is aggressive military powers on the continent. And I thought I would talk briefly about two areas of challenge. One, where the Liberals before the war didn't really succeed, which was female suffrage. It was left to after the war to resolve. And the second, where I think they did succeed, though Richard would disagree with me, I'm sure, is Ireland. Now, um, there was a revolt by many trade unionists, organized labor before the First World War, largely motivated by a feeling the working class voice was not being effectively heard in parliament or government. And of course, many working class people, men at any rate, did have the vote. But women were hardly being heard at all, you may say, because no women had the vote at all. 
Now, Britain had claimed to fight the Boer War for the outlanders, that is, uh, British citizens living in the Transvaal who had no vote. They were not represented at all. And the liberal answer was, give them the vote so they can deal with other grievances. The franchise was the one essential, liberals would say, if you were to get any other rights at all. And the outlanders in South Africa said that lack of the vote marked them with a badge of inferiority. But you may say that British women were outlanders in the land of their birth. They thought lack of the vote symbolized their inferior status. But they weren't entirely without political influence because they enjoyed the vote in local government. And the franchise uh, in local government is very complicated. I won't summarize it now. Any uh, anoraks who are interested can find them in my book. But uh, by the mid 80s, female voters constituted around 17% of the local electorate. And by the late 1890s, around 1,500 women were being elected to local bodies. Apparently, a larger number of women in local government than in 1975. <laughs> but um, opinion was moving in favor of women's suffrage. And various private members' bills at the beginning of the 20th century record, recorded pro suffrage majorities in Parliament, though the government wouldn't take them up and they had no effect. Now, it must be remembered, I mean, too many people writing about this put the difficulties down solely to male misogyny. Now, I wouldn't deny for a moment that there was male misogyny. All I would say was it wasn't the only factor. And first, one has to remember there were a number of prominent women from the time of Florence Nightingale who opposed female suffrage. They included Mrs. Asquith, the wife of the Prime Minister, Lady Randolph Churchill, the mother of Winston Churchill, the archaeologist Gertrude Bell, the novelist Mrs. Humphrey Ward, and until November 1906, Beatrice Webb. And some female opponents went so far to work for anti-suffrage organizations, thereby exposing themselves to the paradox that by their very activity, they were proving that women had as much aptitude for national politics as men. There is something a little comic Lord Robert Cecil, who was a younger son of Lord Salisbury and, and a Conservative MP in favour of female suffrage, he said, there's something a little comic in the energy and the ability and the eloquence with which a writer like Mrs. Humphrey Ward proclaims to the world that she ought not to be trusted to exercise the franchise. And opponents of women's suffrage put forward the doctrine of separate spheres, according to which women were equipped to make decisions on such matters as education and public health why they had to vote in local government, but not the high political issues of state and empire. And Ethel Snowden, wife of the Labour politician, said, with a high disdain of logic, anti-suffrage women have proclaimed that the sphere of woman is the home and have come out of the house to prove it. <laughs> now, in 1897, the yeah. National Union of Women's Suffrage Societies, NUSSF, which was a loose non Yeah, come and guess it, love. I've not got my camera on at the moment. <laughs> Tell people to mute. They just don't. Oh. Fine, carry on. Uh, the NUWSS, a loose non-party federation, was formed, which sought by constitutional and legal methods to secure the enfranchisement of women. Now, the leader was Miss Millicent Garrett Fawcett, and she was the widow of Henry Fawcett, the blind postmaster general in Gladstone's second government. But she became a liberal unionist in 1886, in effect, a conservative, and came to support both the Boer War and the First World War, which is why a number of um, left-wing women's organizations perhaps don't recognize her as much as they should. She was also, incidentally, a supporter of proportional representation, as Henry Fawcett was. And the NUWSS attracted a large membership dominated by middle-class women, which was perhaps inevitable because most working class women who lived in households without servants could not spare the time for political activity. And it was a non-party organization until 1912, a supporting in every constituency the candidates most sympathetic for women's suffrage, generally the liberal. But in 1912, it came for reasons I'll talk about to support the Labour Party. <laughs> 
In 1903, a new organization was formed to press the cause more forcefully, the Women's Social and Political Union, WSPU, led by Mrs. Emmeline Pankhurst. And at first, this wasn't a militant organization. It worked with the other one. It later became more militant. Now, Mrs. Pankhurst was the widow of a Manchester suffrage campaigner, and she'd done voluntary work as a poor law guardian. But when her husband died, she took paid employment as a registrar of births and deaths in a poorer district of Manchester, and her conscience was stirred by the plight of many young mothers who came to register births, some as young as 13, and by unjust marriage and divorce laws. She was a spellbinding orator. She'd been elected to the National Executive of the Independent Labour Party, the ILP, and was one for the cause when she discovered that a hall built in memory of her late husband, who was a founder member, was used by a branch of the ILP whose membership was confined to men. Now, it would seem the Liberals should easily resolve this issue because, after all, it fits so well with liberal philosophy. But actually, female suffrage posed huge problems for both of the major parties, and perhaps particularly for the Liberals. The Liberals, the fact they couldn't resolve them, I think, played a major part in the party's downfall uh, during the war. And there were two main difficulties. The first was that both major parties were divided and they were very frightened of divisive issues because they'd seen the breakup of parties on two divisive issues recently. First Home Rule in 1886, and then Tariff Reform in 1903, both of which led to long periods in the wilderness. Now, amongst Liberals, a majority of MPs favoured female suffrage, as did the General Committee of the National Liberal Federation, which represented Liberals outside Parliament. But since Gladstone, every Liberal leader had been hostile, including Gladstone, uh, uh, Rosebery, Harcourt, and Asquith, and it's particularly unfortunate that Asquith was so determined an opponent, and he was to call women's suffrage in 1910 a most repulsive subject. Mrs. Fawcett in her autobiography said, our greatest enemy in the Liberal Party was Mr. Asquith. It's fair that he was not a total misogynist, because as a Home Secretary in 1893, he'd appointed the first female factory inspectors, and was later to support equality of status for women with men at Cambridge University and the admission of peeresses to the House of Lords. But he was a fatal stumbling block to female suffrage. Now, by contrast with the Liberals, the last four Conservative leaders, Disraeli, Lord Salisbury, Balfour and Bonner Law, were favourable to female suffrage. So was the National Union representing the Conservative Party in the country. The party that was against, oddly, was the Liberal Unionist leaders, Joseph and Austin Chamberlain, who were strongly opposed, and indeed to women playing any part in public affairs at all. There's an anecdote of when Beatrice Webb was intending to become engaged to Joseph Chamberlain, and she visited his house at Highbury in Birmingham in January 1884, and an engagement seemed in prospect. But Joe burst out with some irritation, I have only one domestic trouble, my sister and daughter are bitten with the women's rights mania. I don't allow any action on the subject. You don't allow division of opinion in your household, Mr. Chamberlain. I can't help people thinking different from me, Chamberlain replied. But you don't allow the expression of the difference, Beatrice said. No, was Chamberlain's response. And she said that little word ended our intercourse. There was to be no engagement. Now, um, because mo both major parties were divided, no party leader was to make women's suffrage a priority. So the Liberals were not prepared to sponsor a government measure, nor to allow parliamentary time for a private member's bill. And the second problem was a division within the major parties, not only whether the suffrage should be granted, but also on the terms on which it could be granted. Now, as you know, I'm sure Britain was not a democracy before 1914. About 60% of adult males had the vote, and the vote was broadly based on some relationship with property. You were an occupier, a householder, or a lodger. Now, were you going to just enfranchise women on the same conditions as men? If so, only a small number of women would get the vote, and they would be mostly conservatives in relationship to property. Uh, so that was a problem. Now, both of the women's organizations said women should be granted a suffrage on the same terms as men. They did not support full adult suffrage for men and women, which would have involved a far larger addition to the electorate than any of the previous reform bills they thought too radical. And they said it would have been too controversial to pass the Commons, let alone the Lords. And Mrs. Fawcett said adult suffrage was both undesirable and unnecessary. 
and she said there was not much genuine demand for it. In any case, our position is clear. Any change in the direction of adult manhood suffrage would make our task infinitely more difficult of attainment. Now, the property franchise meant only one million out of 13 women, million women would get the vote, and only a minuscule proportion of married women, few of whom were property owners, occupiers, or householders in their own right. So most of the women in franchise would be unmarried or widowed. And it meant a woman would lose her rights of citizenship when she married and only regain them when she was widowed. As one MP put it somewhat unkindly, as early as 1875, in relation to a bill proposing female enfranchisement on this basis, elderly virgins, widows, a large class of the demi-monde and kept women would be admitted to the franchise, while the married women of England, mothers who formed the mainstay of the nation, were rigidly excluded. And of course, the liberals wouldn't support that because it meant a huge um, accretion to the Tory vote. The only countries which before 1960 enacted female suffrage, New Zealand and Australia, had not faced this problem because they started from a position of full adult suffrage for men. So the suffragettes saw the problem in terms of gender, the liberals in terms of democracy, whose claims the suffragettes seem to be denying. Now, of course, you may say, what about full adult suffrage for all men and women over 21, which was a solution reached in the 1928 Representation of the People Act? Now, that was the policy of the Infant Labour Party, endorsed at par various party conferences. And they said, to extend the franchise on a property qualification to a section only is a retrograde step and should be opposed. But the trouble with that was it would have alienated the more conservative supporters of female suffrage and would have been rejected in the Lords. And those who believed rather absurdly, but a lot of people did then, that women would vote as a bloc. Of course, they don't any more than men do. And they were particularly opposed since it would mean more women than men on the electoral register, which shocked rather more conservative men. And one radical MP, Henry Labuschere, member of the Liberal Party, said in 1904, the country would be absolutely in the hands of women. Now, the Liberals did not want to introduce a false reform bill, which they should have done, because the existing franchise did not exclude any specific social class or community, so there was little pressure for it, and it would have had to deal with various anomalies in the franchise, which the Unionist House of Lords would not support, like removing plural voting and the university constituencies, and that had to have to be a redistribution measure, which would mean drastically reducing the number of Irish constituencies, and the Irish party wouldn't have that till home rule was on the statute book. So franchise reform was blocked. So the problem was not due solely to misogyny. But nevertheless, you can understand why the female suffragists uh, resorted to militancy. Lord Robert Cecil, I quote again, said, I know of no questions which has given greater distrust, force to distrust in our parliamentary institutions. And a Liberal MP asked the Commons to imagine a foreigner coming to this country and asking what the opinion of the House of Commons is in regard to women's suffrage. He would be told the question was debated in this House for 40 years. He would be told for the last quarter of a century it had a permanent majority in this House. He would then say, very likely, I suppose this is a democratic and representative assembly. And he explains to me why this does not become law. So it's understandable that militancy was served. But it's also understandable that militancy simply put the Liberals against the cause, because they took the view that any cause should be accepted by a rational argument. And I think when the vote came, first in 1918 on a limited basis in 1928, it was due less to the militants, in my view, than to decades of quiet, patient, educative work by the NUSS under Mrs. Fawcett. And she accurately predicted that female suffrage would come about not as an isolated phenomenon, it will come as a necessary corollary of the other changes which have been gradually and steadily modifying this century the social history of our country. It will be a political change, not of a very great or extensive character in itself, based on social, educational and economic changes which have already taken place. And so it was to be, but success did not have the consequences anticipated either by the suffragists or their opponents. Both believed that women's suffrage would have radical consequences, whether they favoured them or not. But these changes did not occur for many years, not perhaps until the 1960s. Until then, the main political effect of female suffrage was almost certainly to strengthen the Conservatives.
because women were much less likely to be trade unionists than men and much more likely to be churchgoers than men, and that helped the Conservative vote. And survey evidence from 1945 onwards shows that at every general election, for at least 25 years afterwards, women were more likely than men to vote Conservative. In 1969, a secret internal Conservative Party report was to conclude that if women had not enjoyed the vote, Labour would have been in power nearly continuously since 1945. Now, um, I now come on to what I think was a success, but I think Richard will no doubt dispute this, but I'm talking about Ireland and Ulster. And this was clearly seen dangerous at the time, and some people said wrongly, in my view, this was going to lead to civil war. Now, by the time war broke out, liberals had accepted, too late in my view, that there was no way to enforce Ulster to be inside an Irish Home Rule Parliament, and Ulster was given the right to exclude itself. And there were two problems with that. The first was for how long? The Irish nationalists said just for a limited period of time, no more. The unionists said until we consent to come in. Now, by the outbreak of war, that problem had been solved. Asquith agreed to exclusion for an unlimited period, or at least until a unionist opinion changed. The second, much more difficult problem was what was to count as Ulster? Now, you may say the province of Ulster is nine counties, but the uh, unionists did not insist on that. Uh, and the nationalists would have done better to insist on it because then you'd have got a Catholic majority much earlier than you have. There now is just a very small Catholic majority in Northern Ireland. Should I say a majority of those brought up as Catholics over the majority of those brought up as Protestant? I guess you'll be settled by the secular middle, but that's a different point. But um, uh, the, in, the, in Ulster as a whole, there was a small majority of Protestants. But though by 1914, the small majority of constituencies were in the hands of the nationalists. But um, it was agreed generally that the three counties with large Catholic majorities, which were Cavan, Monaghan, and Donegal, should go with the Dublin Home Rule Parliament. And they are, of course, now in the Irish Republic. It was also agreed that the four strongly Protestant counties, which were Antrim, Derry, Armagh, and Downs, they had large Protestant majorities. It was agreed that they should be excluded. But people couldn't agree on Fermanagh and Tyrone. Now, Fermanagh and Tyrone had very small Catholic majorities, a minuscule Catholic majority. And the, Catholic, the nationalists said, we can't agree to any form of home rule which keeps Fermanagh and Tyrone out. And the unionists said, we can't agree to any form of home rule which puts them in. And there was a Buckingham Palace conference shortly before the war at which the, uh, this disagreement was made manifest. And at the end of it, the Irish uh, Unionist leader, Sir Edward Carson, went over to the Nationalist leader, John Redmond, saying, I'd like to say how much I admire your stand on Fermanagh and Tyrone. And if I was in your position, I would take exactly the same view as you've taken. And Redmond replied to Carson, well, I feel exactly the same myself. Uh, we've got to your position. If I was in your position, I'd take exactly the same <coughs> position as you do. And Asper threw up his hands at how are we ever going to resolve the problem of Ireland. And that was the issue which people thought would lead to civil war. Now, I do accept that the border between uh, Northern Ireland, or Ulster, whatever you call it, and the rest of Ireland would have been settled by force. I think there's no question about it. There hadn't been a war. It could only lead to civil war if Ireland could command support from the other side of the Irish Sea. And by 1914, it was becoming doubtful because the Unionists were worried as the international implications of the Ulster conflict and fearful that enemy powers might take advantage of it. On the 15th of March, 1914, Austin Chamberlain noted in his diary, the extraordinary Austro-German outburst of feeling against Russia at this moment is not wholly divorced from the spectacle of our domestic difficulties. And if for any reason our participation were impossible, Germany might provoke a quarrel with Russia and France. And just a little later, Asquith wrote to his girlfriend, we're very lucky Asquith had a girlfriend because these letters were sent every day. They included cabinet secrets, talk about official <laughs> secrets. And even after the war broke out, where, where troops were stationed, all the rest of it. But um, the postal service much more efficient then. He said at one point, he was writing during cabinet meetings, he said, I'd better send the letter off now. It won't reach you tonight in the East End of London by the post. The post would be slow. And he said, the Tories are thoroughly cowed. They think that the army revolt is going to do them harm in the country. 
and they believed that precipitate action would lose support of public opinion on the other side of the Irish Sea. In any case, what was Ulster to be arguing against? And Lloyd George said rightly, men would die for the empire, but not for Tyrone and for Manor. So I think that border would have been settled by force, but the extremists on either side would not have had any support in England, and no one was clear what they would be fighting about. And the British parties were actually much closer in Irish matters than appeared the, uh, or willing to admit. Home rule on the basis of partition was a fait accompli, and the years of party struggle had produced the materials for settlement by consent. Now, a Dublin parliament, it would have got going if it hadn't been for the war. It's on, beyond the statute book. It would have been very moderate. John Redmond, the Irish nationalist leader, was a, a, a strong imperialist supporter of the British Empire. And the Irish nationalists, people sometimes forget, to have been supported by Cecil Rhodes, who thought an Irish parliament would be like a South African or Cape parliament or Canadian parliament, be part strengthening the empire. And uh, Redmond certainly took that view. It would not have adopted extreme clerical policies, and the Unionists would have seen it wasn't really as frightening and dangerous as they would have believed. And it's interesting that um, when the war broke out, John Redmond, the Irish nationalist leader, said to the government, you can take all your troops out of Ireland, we support the war. And um, on the day Parliament was prorogued after the war, on 18th of September, the Labour MP, Will Crooks, asked MP to sing God Save the King. The Irish nationalists remarkably joined in, and Crooks cried out, God Save Ireland, to which Redmond replied, and God Save England too. And he said, this war is undertaken in defense of the highest principles of religion, morality, and right. In this war, for the first time, certainly for over 100 years, I feel that Ireland's interests are precisely the same as yours. She feels and will feel that British democracy has kept faith with her. She knows this is a just war. She is moved in a very special way by the fact this war is undertaken in the defense of small nations and oppressed people, what Gladstone had said about the union of hearts replacing a union by force. Home rule had won goodwill for Britain, but it was too late, because after the war, the more radical voices of Sinn Féin were heard and Ireland broke off from the rest of Britain. And whereas Redmond had supported Britain's war effort in 1914, De Valera in 1939 did not. So there, I think the Irish question was tantalizingly, tantalizing very near solution had the war not broken out and radicalized Ireland as it did countries on the continent. And I think Ireland after that is much more similar to countries on the continent than to the liberal political cultural Britain. And on that point, I've spoken too long. I will now stop. Thank you. Lots of um discuss later, Vernon, but first, Richard, it would be um, uh, welcome, and uh, I look forward to hearing your take on Dangerfield. Thank you very much. Can everybody hear me clearly? Yep. Okay, good. I'm going to share my screen and uh, run a slideshow. And... <laughs> Uh, hopefully you can now see those slides. So um, what I want to talk about is uh, not really to engage uh, with the merits of Dangerfield's thesis, as Vernon has done in his very interesting book and in his talk. I will say I don't think that he and I are that far apart on, on the question of, of Ireland. Um, and also, I agree with his uh, fundamental conclusion um, that there are strong aspects of liberal culture uh, which survive 1914. Indeed, I'll, I'll return to that point. But instead of trying to sort of argue about whether, whether Dangerfield was right or wrong, I think it's interesting to explore the question of, as Anne said earlier, why we're still arguing about this particular book or why it's an important point of reference a book that was initially published in 1935. Uh, we're talking about it um, nearly uh, you know, 90 years later. And I think it's particularly interesting to ask that because it wasn't a book which was intended to uh, necessarily uh, have 
full academic credibility. And indeed, although there are some books of that era which still are important points of reference in the scholarly debate, there simply aren't that many. Um, so in a way, it's not that I'm going to give you a lecture on how to write a book which will last for uh, 100 years and still be debated 100 years. More think of this as kind of me writing some notes to myself as to perhaps some uh, tactics which I really ought to adopt in the future um, in order to uh, you know, sort of try and give my own work um, you know, more longevity. Um, and I think it's an interesting story because uh, Dangerfield was, was an interesting man. He was born in London in 1904, was educated at Oxford, but then crucially, uh, he moved to the USA in 1930, where he uh, went into journalism. And uh, his book then was The Strange Death of Liberal England, published in the USA in 1935, not actually published in the UK until 1936, with, a, with a, few, a few slight differences between the two editions. Um, Changefield's commitment to America can be seen from the fact that he served in the US Army during World War II. He could have served in the British Army. Um, and also his interest in American history. So he publishes several other books. He does eventually return to the question of Ireland in his final book. Um, but his many of his other books about American history uh, including the era of good feelings about the, the early 19th century, uh, for which he won the Pulitzer Prize in the 1950s. Now, thinking about the book itself, um, what, were the, what were the influences on the book and what sources did Dangerfield have available to him? Well, as we've seen, he was born in 1904. He had a memory of Halley's Comet uh, coming past in 1910, but as he said himself in the book, my own recollections were not very helpful. So he was in the position of a, a young man who um, was, um, you know, in a, in a in a awkward position, I think, as, as sort of young historians may often find themselves, of writing about recent history when there were plenty of people still around who could remember it and might potentially um, you know, resent uh, being told about uh, what had gone on by somebody who hadn't. Well, he had been there at the time, but he hadn't been there in a very sort of meaningful capacity, if you like. He could only remember the era as a child, uh, and so he was you know, sort of vulnerable to that type of criticism. And I, I kind of feel some sympathy with him uh, on that score because the people who were there don't necessarily always get it right either. Now, in terms of the um, sources that he drew upon, it was mainly, um, uh, well, he was pretty much exclusively based on uh, published materials because the necessary archives were not yet available. Uh, he drew on many autobiographies and biographies. He also drew on official documents from the Board of Trade and from the Home Office. And the last item in his bibliography is marked uh, private information. And it's not entirely clear how extensive that private information was, whether he did anything in the way of conducting oral history interviews. It's, it's not obvious that he did. So we don't, we don't quite know what that represented. Um, but I think that the book should be seen not only um, because of its content, not only interesting only because of its content, but because it was an early contribution to the field that we now call contemporary history. And people were, one or two reviewers, at least one I've seen, did refer to it as a contribu contribution to contemporary history, which has now become a kind of a formal academic discipline. At the same time, this wasn't something which was very well recognized as a discipline at the time. And um, historical journals, of which, of course, there weren't so many as there are today, uh, didn't review it. Um, instead, it was reviewed, for example, in the journal. It was, it was reviewed widely in the press. It was reviewed in the weeklies. It was reviewed in quarterly journals. Uh, in, in academic terms, it was reviewed in the journal Social Science and at least one public library, Falco Public Library, as it happens, filed it under sociology. So people didn't entirely know uh, what to do with this book. Um, and in terms of, of influences, well, 
I think the style of the book, the irreverent uh, style, the, you know, the witty style is important. And Lytton Strachey, the guy with the beard on the slide, who had published the book Eminent Victorians in 1918, uh, was a major influence, the kind of um, debunking of, um, how should I say, um, you know, sort of established, uh, rather stuffy figures. And so, you know, a, an element of, of poking fun, which again, I think is obviously a contribution to the success of the book. Um, and you can note also around this time that uh, Maynard Keynes's book, The Economic Consequences of the Peace, published in 1919, uh, that was a kind of an eyewitness account in part of the uh, uh, Paris Peace Conference, and was um, very frank, in, or uh, some would say unfair in its pen portraits equally. Margot Asquith's autobiography was seen by many as going uh, you know, beyond uh, the pale in terms of you know, really pushing at the limits of, of what was um, proper and appropriate, what was decorous uh, for public figures to say. And again, it's worth emphasizing that Dangerfield wasn't going for conventional academic credibility, uh, professional historians. There is one professional historian, RCK Ensor, who you may may well have heard of, uh, mm -hmm. does um, review it and um, criticizes it on many points of detail, uh, not unfairly. You know, he sort of accurately points out uh, sort of errors um, and small, small points. But again, Dangerfield wasn't somebody who, at this stage of his career, at, the, at least, was he was really going to be bothered by that because he was, if you like, aiming at a kind of higher truth. So as he wrote in 1937, history which reconciles incompatibles and balances probabilities by its very nature eventually reaches the reality of fiction. And that is the highest reality of all. So uh, Ensor is criticizing him for a, a novelistic version of history, but in fact, that is what Dangerfield is really actually aiming at. And just to give a sense of the kind of epigrammatic style, uh, it is a fun book to read. I'm sure most people in the room will have read it, in fact, um, but just to sort of remind you of the, of the style, um, uh, just give you one quotation. For liberalism, after all, implies rather more than a political creed or an economic philosophy. It is a profoundly conscience-stricken state of mind. It is the final expression of everything which is respectable, God-fearing, and frightened. The poor, it says, are always with us, and something must certainly be done for them. Not too much, of course, that would never do, but something. And so we see here that um, Dangerfield isn't merely trying to provide historical reasons for uh, the, what he sees as the, the failure of liberalism or the end of liberalism. Rather, he is um, trying to, uh, you know, he's, he's actually offering an evaluation. He's not neutral about liberalism. The pre-1914 version of liberalism is not something that he's keen on. He really wants to be uh, more radical. And for him, uh, the, the sort of failure of liberalism as he sees it, the end of liberalism is actually a good thing. Um, now, we might ask ourselves, was there a danger field thesis? You might say, well, of course there was. Everybody knows that. But as we'll see in a minute, uh, there are some aspects of the book which are very incoherent uh, or apparently contradictory. Uh, and so sometimes um, Dangerfield could be opaque. It's difficult to work out exactly what he's arguing. However, I think there are some key elements which we reasonably can pull out um, and, and say that they were core to his argument. Uh, certainly, he uh, put a strong emphasis on the years 1910 to 1914 as the crucial phase. And I think that is quite important because he is um, saying, uh, or rather, you know, he's, he's not saying, or doesn't appear to be saying, that the liberalism was doomed before uh, that period. Or, I mean, we're going to see he contradicts himself on that point, but, but certainly he's really saying, it's not just that liberalism was doomed before 1914, it was that there was something special about this particular 
exact pre-war phase which doomed it. And again, fairly clear, he's arguing the Liberals were unable to cope with the triple threat posed by the rise of the Labour Party, the suffragettes and the Ulster crisis. And again, um, we can see here the influence of uh, psychoanalytical theories, in particular those of Carl Jung, and the idea of the collective unconscious. So Dangerfield isn't just making a point, as, as Vernon rightly said, about the decline of the Liberal Party, uh, he's actually suggesting that the British experienced some form of mass emotional crisis, or not a phrase people use any longer, but you know, nervous breakdown. Um, and so to have that in his own words, it, it was in 1910 that fires long smouldering in the English spirit suddenly flared up so that by the end of 1913, liberal England was reduced to ashes. So again, to come to the, contradictory, to come to the contradictions, when did uh, liberalism die according to George Dangerfield? And here, as reviewers pointed out at the time, he gives quite a range of different answers. Um, so, in fact, although I've said that he puts a lot of emphasis on 1910 to 1914, he actually argues on page 10 of the book, the Liberal Party, which came back to Westminster with an overwhelming majority in 1906, was already doomed. So he's kind of con contradicting or undermining a fundamental part of his thesis there. Um, then, he says, when Sir Henry Campbell Bannerman died in 1908, it was like the passing of true liberalism. That's just six pages later. Uh, then the true pre-war liberalism was killed or it killed itself in 1913. That's what he's said in the preface to the book, but I'm doing these in chronological order. Um, then the deepest impulse in the great strike movement of 1910 to 1914 was an unconscious one. Parliament shuddered before it and under its impact, liberal England died. So therefore giving a longer time span. Um, and then... Uh, talking about the so-called Kara mutiny or Kara incident of March 1914, one might go so far as to say that Goff's mutiny was the precise moment of liberal England's death. And then talking about the so-called Bachelor's Walk massacre of 26th of July 1914, showing that violence had already broken out, in fact, uh, even before um, the start of the war in Ireland. In that obscene little spatter of blood on the Dublin Keys, the word Finnis was written to the great liberal battles of the 19th century. And then finally, with Rupert Brooke's death on, on 23rd of April 1915, one sees the extinction of liberal England. And I'm not even sure that I've successfully pulled out all the different moments within the book where he claims that uh, liberal England had died. Um, and as I say, reviewers, uh, some reviewers at any rate, do kind of make a note of this. But perhaps more importantly, is what did Lib what did Dangerfield think had died? And again, I think uh, that Vernon was right earlier on when he said that it, maybe the primary focus wasn't so much on the Liberal Party as on liberal culture. Um, and I think that. Uh, that's true, but also, um, as the Times Literary Supplements reviewer points out, there is a kind of a conflation or, or a lack of specificity in uh, Dangerfield's claims. So what is this liberal England which strangely died? Mr Dangerfield uses the description to mean liberalism, the Liberal Party and the pre-war world. So there is some kind of sliding from uh, one theme to another, which allows him to make particular points at particular moments in a way which helps carry the reader along. And yet there is this um, you know, vagueness or, or conflation of, of different things, which is, again, one of the things which makes the book sort of tricky to argue or, or with or slippery in certain respects. And um, maybe the from taking the preface to the American edition, and all the quotations I've taken have been from the American edition, by the way. 
Um, I think that maybe this does encapsulate uh, most profoundly what Dangerfield meant in when talking about liberalism. Um, when he said, I realize, of course, that the world liberal will always have a meaning so long as there is one democracy left in the world or any remnant of a middle class. But the true pre-war liberalism, supported as it still was in 1910 by free trade, a majority in parliament, the Ten Commandments and the illusion of progress can never return. It was killed or it killed itself in 1913. I've quoted that little bit earlier on in the previous slide. And a very good thing too, he says. So um, this is interesting because Dangefield is clearly aware that a lot of people are going to say, well, actually liberalism hasn't died. In some respect, it's alive unwell. And I don't think there's any particular contradiction between saying that some aspects of liberal culture died and Dangerfield's more specific argument that a particular version of liberalism um, had, in fact, died uh, by 1914. And I guess um, if you kind of look at the things which he's listing as being important to liberalism, uh, free trade, a majority in parliament, the Ten Commandments and the illusion of progress. Well, the first one is pretty specific. And although you might say or maybe free trade hadn't fully died by 1914, um, that certainly was something which had gone by the wayside by 1931, perhaps. Um, a majority in Parliament had clearly gone by uh, 1918. And then the Ten Commandments and the Illusion of Progress, these are more kind of rhetorical things, which is very difficult to pin down, but clearly some kind of profound sense of morality um, uh, is, is linked, is, is, is sort of bound up with, with the Ten Commandments. So I think that he is suggesting that a particular kind of moral order has collapsed. And he's, he, as I say, he himself is aware that uh, some people are going to say, well, you know, liberalism uh, actually hasn't died. And so to turn to uh, that reception and what people said at the time, um, I've what I've tried to do here is not describe every aspect of the reception, which is very complex, but only to focus on this particular question of whether or not people thought that liberal England had in fact died. Now, I would say that um, some reviewers did agree with Dangerfield that liberalism has died, didn't see that as a particularly controversial statement. I would say that many did not. I'm probably going to say uh, that the majority did not, although I haven't necessarily tracked down every single review that is out there. Um, and so J.A. Spender, the veteran liberal journalist, uh, in his review said, I think I could tell the story quite as plausibly as that of the suicide of Toryism as of the death of liberalism. R.C.K. Enser, the historian I mentioned earlier, said, not all of us believe progress to be an illusion or liberalism to be dead in England. Either this is not liberalism or it remains unburied, said the TLS review, which I quoted from earlier on. And uh, the reviewer in the Daily Mirror says of, of his thesis, this will infuriate the liberals who are not as dead as Mr. Dangerfield supposes. The Liberal Party, after all, is not the same thing as liberal England. In fairness, Dangerfield hadn't explicitly said it was. Um, and then an exception, um, Truth, the right-wing conservative magazine, um, said that there are doubtless those who, on taking up Mr. George Dainfield's The Strange Death of Liberal England, will at once accept the book's title as an unwarrantable assumption of something that has not yet happened. So that is interesting, I think, because Truth uh, actually agreed with Dangerfield that liberalism was, was kind of over or dead, but detected that uh, a large number of people would take a, a different view. And so I think what is interesting to see here is the extent to which contemporaries uh, did in fact contest Dangerfield's thesis when he first put it across. Now, why then, you know, what, what, what are my notes to myself as to how to write a book which is going to persist this long and still be argued over? Well, um, a catchy title is a very good start. Um, and uh, it's been much imitated by uh, or played on, if you like, um, sometimes in creative ways, uh, as in as in Vernon's titles. 
Um, so, you know, if you can, if you can sort of manage a title like that, you're onto a good start. Uh, I've mentioned the highly readable, almost knockabout iconoclastic style. I would say that maybe the real sweet spot for a historian who wants to have their work discussed is that it's got to seem plausible. It can't be an absolutely ridiculous argument, but on the other hand, it's not got to be so uh, uncontentious that everybody just agrees with it and says, yes, that's fine and moves on. Like, you've got to say something that people want to argue with. Um, now, to some extent, it survived uh, because it provide, the book provided a foil for later historians. It gave them something to argue against. And sometimes I think it would be fair to say that historians have argued against a caricatured version of the argument or a simplified version of the argument as opposed to what Dangerfield actually said uh, himself. Um, so I would describe the book as productively provocative. That is to say, nobody's going to uh, agree with it today in its entirety, as we've seen, lots of people didn't agree to it, with it uh, in many ways when it originally came out. But in a sense, it put its finger on something, it kind of touched a nerve. Um, it was ambiguous enough to allow others to see what they wanted in the book, uh, and, you know, run with it in the ways that they wanted to. Um, and also, perhaps most importantly, it addressed a significant but probably unanswerable historical problem because of this question of, you know, the counterfactual of what might have happened if the war had not occurred. Um, it gives enormous scope for arguing about this, this issue about the fate of the Liberal, not only the Liberal Party, but the knock on implications that that had for the other major parties and British politics more generally. And in other words, I would conclude by saying the book raised important questions, even if it did not get all the answers right. And I'm just going to uh, leave you with a final slide with a couple of items of further reading, uh, which I found useful in uh, preparing this talk. Um, and uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Richard. That was very um, entertaining. Um, I, I'm going to take questions uh, shortly, but first, Duncan uh, on my right is going to say a few words about the group and about how we're going to handle the questions. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks very much indeed. Uh, and so my name is Duncan Brack. I'm the editor of the Journal of Liberal History. I just wanted to say a few words for those of you who are not familiar with the Liberal History Group about what we do uh, and about a special offer that is ready for you at the end of the meeting. Um, we were founded when this party was set up, the Liberal Democrats were founded in 1988, to promote the discussion and research of histories of the Liberal Democrats and our predecessor parties, the Liberal Party and the SDP. And we do this in four main ways. One is through organizing meetings like this one. I'm sure many of you have been to ones before. Mm -hmm. I can tell you that our next meeting will be at Liberal Democrat Federal Conference in September in Bournemouth. It's going to be on the Saturday evening of the conference, and it will be the launch of our next publication, which is a short booklet called, provisionally called, What Do the Liberals Ever Do For You? Um, which is basically a concise summary of the major achievements of the Liberal Party and Liberal Democrats, um, not just in government, but in opposition, private members' bills, arguing for campaigning and arguing and so on, going back to the 17th century and going right up to the coalition. Uh, so we hope that will be of interest to people, and we are launching it with a variety of star speakers that we're still sorting out. Uh, a conference in September, uh, and we'll uh, let you know about that. Um, we produce a range of publications, of which that will be the newest one, also other concise history booklets and a number of reference books. Uh, the third thing we do is maintain the website. So you can look at all of this at our website uh, online, liberalhistory.org.uk. And of course, the main thing we do is publish this, the Journal of Liberal History. Um, it's a quarterly publication, contains articles, biographies, reports of meetings, book reviews, and much else. Uh, this is the latest issue, but the next issue actually is going to go to print this week, so it should be out uh, if you're a subscriber next week. Um, and it, that was a special issue on the record of the Lloyd George Coalition government uh, last time that Liberals were in power before the 2010-2015 coalition. Um, and if you, so actually we have two special offers for you today, if you subscribe to the journal now at this meeting, we will sign you up for the next two issues, and we run a, a September to September 
um, membership year. So basically, you will get six issues. You get the last two of this subscription year and all the four of the 23-24 subscription year. And we have print uh, subscriptions and digital or digital plus print. Uh, and another offer, of course, is that you will all want to provide copies of Bernard's <laughs> book, and I'm sure he will be ready to sign them for you. At no extra charge. At, at no extra charge. <laughs> um, and the, uh, we'll be selling them at the end of the meeting. The, uh, uh, the basic price is £35 from Bikeback Publishing. We are sending it to anybody here at the meeting at £25, and if you're a subscriber to the Journal of Liberal History, £20. Thanks Great. very much. Thank you very much, Duncan. Um, so I'm going to take um, a question from the room and then a question from um, our Zoom attendees, yeah. and they are going to ask their questions in person. And I'm going to say you, please could uh, you all give your names and then your question. And um, can I take the person at the back? Uh, not much changing. Um, then I mentioned this to the legal ladies of post, Jim uh, Rossovich. Don't think you mentioned Kevin Barrett. What was his attitude? I think you, yes, you mentioned a Campbell Bannerman. Campbell Bannerman was very mildly sympathetic and told a women's delegation they had to uh, exert a lot of patience, take a long time. He wasn't going to exert himself on this. Thank you. Can we, can we have a question? Not ready yet. Not Good ready. Question. Can we take another one from the room? Just here, thank you. Um, um, Councillor Tony Patterson. Um, I'd like to ask um, uh, Brian Bogdan, you said what liberal ideology could not deal with was aggressive military powers on the continent uh, in the First World War. And what, what I wanted to ask was, you know, Richard Holday, who is the greatest philosopher, statesman, you know, our party has ever had, uh, uh, I submit, um, was, you know, did a brilliant formative job in creating the territorial army of the British Expeditionary Force. So on, on that very issue that we were talking about, and, and he didn't have any sort of philosophical problems with that. Um, and, and I wonder how you sort of see it leading on from there through history. I'm, I'm just in the course of setting up a, a new group called Liberal Democrat Friends of Ukraine to try to get the Liberal Party, the Dem Party, to be more um, robust in its stance over Ukraine. Um, so I'm very interested in your answer to the sort of trajectory of Liberal history, please. Well, I don't think Haldane was a great philosopher or a great statesman, except on matters connected with education. I mean, philosophy has, as one of his critics said, the gift of making what appeared until he wrote clear um, are no longer clear. And very much uh, over-influenced, I think, by study of Hegel, um, who, um, as Isaiah Berlin once said, that Hegel was a deep swamp which many enter, but from you, which few emerge. <laughs> and um, I think that cost him a lot of trouble. His, his memoirs are very self-aggrandizing about that. He did not favor the sending of an expeditionary force to France. But in any case, the more important point was the army was far too small for um, to, 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 um, to really add very much. I mean, it helped the Battle of Oman, it's true. But my point was, it wasn't a favor in the Liberal Party, it was a Liberal culture in general, the only way to stop the war. If you believed, as Liberal did, that Germany was an aggressive power, she couldn't be stopped just by naval power, just by a naval blockade. You needed a mass army. And the only way to create a mass army was conscription. And the only people in favor of that, it was Conservative Party were against, were, were generals and the so-called blimps. But in my view, and this is not a view I come to happily, but I, I, I can't help thinking, that the only way to have stopped a war is if Britain had had a large enough army to have deterred Germany from risking Britain coming into the war. As it was, a lot of the histories imply Britain was key, but it, four divisions, uh, I think it was, sending to the continent, it made the Germans wouldn't be deterred by that. The same is true in the, in the 1930s. The argument was really about uh, air rearmament. And again, the only way to have stopped the Germans from aggression would have been if Britain had a large enough mass army to uh, stop that. We, we learned that really at the time of the Korean War with a heavy rearmament program, but it wasn't just the Liberal Party, it was Liberal Britain as a whole could not comprehend an aggressive and militaristic philosophy from the central powers. And their foreign policy was incompatible with their defense policy because foreign policy assumed some form of collective security through the alliance system. It couldn't work with Britain being militarily so weak I think in the late 30s, 1930s, when we were negotiating with the Soviet Union, 
um, for collective agreement against Nazi Germany, Stalin asked how many divisions Britain would put in the um, battle against Nazi Germany, and we said six. And he said, well, the Soviet Union has 300, so that makes 306. <laughs> and uh, Britain was, uh, people forget from writing about the foreign policy, Britain wasn't taken seriously because she had no army. Bismarck famously said, if the British army landed at Hamburg, he'd ask the German police to arrest it. <laughs> it was a non-militaristic power. Yeah. The, no, no takers uh, on Zoom uh, for a question. Not yet. Not, not yet. Do join in. Can can I looking for a um, female voice um, anywhere? <laughs> um, in the white shirt. Thank you, uh, Marshall Taylor. Typical. Uh, you said uh, it's a question of the burning. You said that in 1906, mm. um, uh, liberals scored 48 percent of the vote, mm. and in 1930, it was down to almost three percent. Mm. What was the actual raw vote approximately, and how well did it? Two numbers compare. Was it more a reflection of the size of the election in the 1930s? Oh, I see what you mean. No, I haven't got yes. the figures with me. They'll be in Butler's British political facts. But yes. Um, yes, and of course, by the mid 30s, the Liberals were no longer putting forward um, enough MPs to form a government anyway, enough candidates. And they did in 1950, they put over a wide um, range, I think 475 candidates. So you could have had, in theory, a Liberal government, but almost all lost their privilege. <laughs> Then and from then on, for many years, there was just a no. number of liberal candidates. But I haven't got those figures. It's an interesting point you make. But um, I think they, they, the Labour Party in, uh, won the vote of progressive women because the Liberals seemed so divided and unhelpful on women's suffrage. And um, the NUS, the NUWSS came to support the Labour Party in 1912, and it made people think the Liberals weren't as progressive as they hoped. Um, but of course, the, the war and the split between Asquith and Lloyd George uh, had a huge influence on the divided party. Can I just, on that point, ask Richard to to come in? How, how influential do you think um, the Liberal leadership's attitude to women's suffrage was in terms of subsequent attitudes to the Liberal Party? That's a good question. Um, I'm, I'm, you know. Lloyd George is quite interesting in the immediate post-war period, the, the 1918 to 1922 period, because they do actually try to, uh, the, you know, the coalition liberals do try to present themselves as, you know, I mean, female friendly, to use a, a term which wouldn't have been used at the time, um, and to make it easier for women to uh, sort of enter the professions and so on. Uh, so they try to make that as a selling point. Um, I think that um, that that's there are all sorts of reasons why that's not going to help the coalition liberals very much. You know, come 1922, because of all the different uh, you know, problems that they face and their ability inability to put up large numbers of candidates, and also that it comes up against to some extent the, um, the sort of the conservatives who. Are rather uneasy in their coalition with the Lloyd George Liberals because they don't like obviously um, things which uh, you know, move in that in the direction of that form of social progress. I don't think that that particular issue causes specific issues for the Conservatives, but um, it's it's rather like um, you know. I don't want to say jumping onto a bandwagon because I think there was an element of sincerity in it, but um, you know, sort of finding a theme which uh, theoretically sounded like it was going to be quite good, but wasn't actually necessarily going to help very much. So, um, and then I think that um, for the you know, the Asquithian liberals, then uh, even though Asquith comes out in 1918 and says, well, he's sort of been converted to uh, votes for women. I don't think that is going to, in itself, gain him uh, very many women's votes. Um, I mean, of course, I know you're working on a book about uh, Violet Bonham Carter. So she, in the in the Paisley by-election in 1920, is a pretty interesting character who does succeed in um, giving a 
you know, a, a female face to the Liberal Party and a very, uh, a very popular one at that time, although, of course, she's frustrated by never ever being able to enter Parliament herself. So those are kind of the beginnings of what would probably be a much longer answer. Uh, I'm just going to uh, use my prerogative to, for a quick follow-up. In your collection of essays, or collection of essays edited by you on after suffrage, when you make that very important point that uh, votes for women in 1918 and universal suffrage in 1928 were not endpoints, they were merely milestones on a journey. You also, yes. it seems to me, a lot of those, yes. a lot of your contributors make the point that there was never a monolithic or anything approaching a monolithic woman's vote, which makes me question Vernon's assertion that, the, that liberal attitudes to suffrage would have influenced women voters. Well, well, I think I would recommend um, the thesis or the now quite a few publications by my former PhD student, Lisa Berry Waite, who has um, written a, a thesis by looking at all the individual female candidates from 1918 through to 1931 and trying to tell their story. You'd, you'd sort of think that this would have been done, but actually, um, it, it really hadn't been done in that systematic way. And there was an attempt um, you know, that by, by looking at their individual election addresses, you can see that they did often make a specific attempt to appeal to what was called the woman's point of view in the, um, particularly in the earlier 20, you know, from 1918 through to maybe you know, the mid 20s. But this did seem to fade away a bit. I mean, they were, of course, playing to what they believed were their strengths in that, um, you know, some, the, 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 the few of them by that stage were directly attacked with people saying that women you know, mustn't stand for parliament. Even conservatives could see that that was not a kind of a, a, a winning game. But they were they were very often pigeonholed into the idea that they would supposedly be women would be naturally more interested in uh, you know, sort of social uh, questions and things about you can, issues about childcare and so on. And so, to some extent, they had to, you know, try and play to what people thought they were most capable of. But at the same time, they did, um, you know, push back against that as to some some degree uh and it clearly you know, wasn't a winning card uh because apart from anything else they were so often given unwinnable seats mm -hmm. thank thank you richard i'll now shut up um in the uh first cut, uh, shirt there yeah there are people oh, yeah. in i remember but oh, i was the president of the unitarian historical society so i'm obviously interested in non-conformity which was clearly a key element of the liberal culture. And some of the studies that I've certainly read is that it's not the 1910-13 period, but actually the First World War that, that dented nonconformity. Is that belief in progress onwards and ever, forever, was key to nonconformity. So, but yeah, I, I struggle with how that then, the individuals were still there in the 20s and 30s. They were behind the Liberal Party. So that sense of where does the non-conformist culture influence the future of the Liberal Party? Yes, as I wasn't trying to get involved in this debate about the decline of the Liberal Party, but the survival of a Liberal culture. If you're looking at the decline of the Liberal Party, yes, I, I think you're right that um, the war did. Uh, I mean, religious feeling was gradually weakening anyway, and I think the very battle over the 1902 Education Act Showed that because the few people who were religious, the more the extremists took over and fought a battle over the schools as to what they were, whether what parts of the Bible they're going to teach and so on. Whereas I think most people becoming interested less in that issue than in the issue of their children getting a good education. But um, liberal culture did survive very strongly into into war period. It's not often noticed. I mean, as compared with the continent, how despite the depression how little support there was for extremism. The Communist Party had at most one or two MPs and I think about 60,000 members, very small despite the depression. And although you often see pictures of fascists and black shirt marches and so on, they were very, very weak. They didn't have the strength to put up candidates in the parliamentary election in 1935. 
they fought one or two local by-elections with, with no success. The British National Party in 2010 was much more successful. It got 2% of the vote. I mean, no fascist party got 2% of the vote between the war, nowhere near it. Um, it's remarkable, I think, how uh, uh, quite differently from the continent and even from Ireland, how remarkably stable and moderate Britain was. And despite the depression, the sort of paradise compared with anywhere else on the continent, as indeed it was before 1914. Another point liberals may be interested in is that the Aliens Act, which is often seen as illiberal, it's aimed to keep out aliens, by which would have meant Jews, but it actually had in it a statutory right of asylum, uh, which was removed in 1914. So anyone who could prove that they were escaping from political or religious persecution was entitled to enter the country. And no one then would have dreamt of sending people to Rwanda or anything of that sort. It was a highly liberal for some people. Oh, sorry, I'm suddenly re realised we're running out of time and there are questioners um, on Zoom. So should we take a couple of those? Yeah, so uh, we've got two or three in the chat, which I think for... Uh, interest speed I'll just read out um, and perhaps we could take a couple together and then David's raised his hand David Grace uh, we can call him in a moment so question from Tony Harris I think to both speakers memes are very important even if not in examination totally accurate my reading of Dangerfield which is some time ago is that he had felt that the liberals had suffered a failure of nerve they were no longer on the attack but were henceforth holding the line against the establishment but also maybe principally against socialism can liberalism, which holds the line, be the same as that which acts as a revolutionary but change movement? And perhaps we could ask, um, call Ian Sharp's question as well. I can remember as an undergraduate in the 1980s being told by a tutor that Dangerfield's book was a great book, but not to be read as serious history. At the time, there seemed to be at the academic consensus. Do the speakers think historians would reach an equally harsh judgment today or see some wider cultural epistemological value in the book? So, Sean Fernand, why don't you address the question of whether liberals yeah, look, are we, radical? We've spent too long. It's my fault because the title on Dangerfield, I mean, is not very good. And the, I mean, there's a much better book saying that Britain was decadent by the great French historian Eddie Halevi in the last two volumes of his 19th century history. And also a more recent book, remarkably, by the uh, right wing um, journalist Simon Heffer called The Age of Decadence, which I don't agree with, but it's a very good interpretation of that. that that's the view one ought to argue against. And, I mean, I agree with Richard that the best book on the period, apart from mine, of course, is still, <laughs> is still Ensor's book in the Oxford History, published as long ago as 1936. He knew a lot of people on the left. He was a member of the ILP. He knew Ramsay MacDonald, Lloyd George very well, and it's, it's an extremely good book. On the point of the question, I, I, here I disagree, you see. Um, the Liberals hadn't lost their nerves. They still had lots of policies for social reform ready. And the idea that they were frightened of socialism is anachronistic. There were very few socialists in Britain before 1914, very few indeed. The membership so, of the ILP, the national membership, was less than that of the Conservative Primrose League in Burnley. It was very, very small. <laughs> and the Labour Party existed. The Labour Party existed on sufferance from the Liberals with from an electoral pact. The Liberals could at any time smash the Labour Party. No one thought the Labour Party would overtake the Liberals. And indeed, many Labour people thought the idea of a separate Labour Party had turned out to be a mistake. The Liberals are far more radical in their policies of social reform. And I think a natural prediction would have been, without the war, Asquith would have been succeeded by Lloyd George, who would then have been succeeded by Ramsay MacDonald, the leader of a united progressive party. That's what I suppose Blair tried to reproduced in 1997, but was frustrated by getting such a large majority, <laughs> in a small majority of a hung parliament. He, he, he took the view of the left had suffered from being divided. And um, I don't, the Liberals weren't suffering the loss of nerve. They were full on for a lot more reform. An extraordinary government. I mean, they were very, very impressive people. Let me underline that. So uh, they were many of the Conservatives. You compare it with today is very, very sad. It sort of refutes Darwin recently, really. About <laughs> I mean, they were very, very impressive people, and, and the Conservatives too. I mean, really impressive, whether you agree with them or not. Richard, uh, your, should, your 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 take. Should, should I maybe address the other question, which is in the chat, which is about the what 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 is the most significant legacy of the post. 1906 liberal governments for liberal culture and uh, political thought as we're, as we're slightly short of time. Um, yes, go for it. Um, I think that um, the institutions which became what we now call the welfare state were very, very important as a legacy. 
Um, so in terms of the sort of actual policy legacy, that's what I would uh, plump for. And then in terms of uh, liberal culture and political thought, or if you like, what to reframe the question slightly, what, is, what are the most, if, if, um, if we're going to, uh, as, as I said, I do accept Vernon's argument that um, much of liberal culture survives, what, what are the most important bits that survive? Well, again, I would really highlight um, the contributions of both Keynes and Beveridge um, and I think that um, to go slightly back to the to the other question that was, was was asked, I think Keynes is particularly interesting because he, uh, and not only he, is somebody who is willing to be pretty radical in terms of um, not just his policies, but in terms of his thinking about what liberalism is, and in his belief that liberalism is something which it evolves. In other words, um, there aren't fixed principles in, in the sense of, um, you know, believing in free trade and balanced budgets. Those, those might be appropriate at one particular moment. Uh, what, what's, what's really important, the, the most important principle of liberalism uh, is constant um, experimentation, uh, constant reflection and um, you know, constant a commitment, a kind of a, a mental commitment, if you like, to uh, flexibility and uh, evolutionary progress. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chris. And there's one more question to come um, online. Hello, can you hear me? Hello? We can. Good. Um, it's already been noted that um, Dangerfield was attacking well, at least three different targets, um, Liberal England, Liberalism and the Liberal Party. And it's the last one that I'm interested in. I did read the book years ago, but I've always felt that the split between Asquith and Lloyd George had a bigger impact on the party than the things that Dangerfield was talking about. And I have a simple question, which is, it's counterfactual. If there hadn't been the coupon election, is it realistic to suppose there could have been another Liberal government? Richard, shall I, shall I have a go at that one? Um, I think that um, it's, I, I guess, if I was to sort of try and highlight a moment where you think, well, could everything have turned out differently, purely speculating on counterfactuals, um, what if in 1916 Asquith had accepted the offer, Lloyd George's offer, to become Lord Chancellor, a job he'd probably have been pretty good at and had sort of you know, pulled together uh, and shown unity and sort of accepted his demotion, if you like, in the way that Neville Chamberlain did in 1940. Um, of course, you can also think that, of course, they did manage to get back together for a period uh, in uh, 1923, uh, sort of a bit like one of those 70s rock bands that kept splitting up and getting back together. Um, <laughs> But, um, uh, but and, and I think that sometimes the problem was not so much Asquith himself as the people around him who, um, you know, sort of insisted on his you know, dignity more than he did. Um, so I think that, um, you know, I, I would highlight uh, certainly 1916 as being a very uh, key moment, but also the 1920s as a period of great instability, many ups and downs, where there, there certainly are different moments where it looks like a different roll of the dice could have turned out uh, very different outcomes. Well, um, well, I agree about 1916. I think that's a fair point. But I don't think Asquith could have stayed in the government after 1918, because the Lloyd George government, I hope I'm not anticipating the next issue of the journal, was highly <laughs> Ill Ill a highly illiberal government particularly in Ireland, and also in attitude to the trade unions, the outmaneuvering of the trade unions, really beating down of the miners, which um, led to a lot of trouble later on. So um, the, co the, 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 the coalition government and the attitude of Lloyd George led to huge distrust of him throughout the 20s and 30s, um, 
and damaged the Liberals very considerably. So that even when he came up with what you might think are good policies, as in 29, the change in policies, people didn't trust him anymore. And then, of course, contrary to what's often said, he became a great admirer of Hitler in the 1930s, which is hardly a mark of, of liberalism. And um, uh, so I, I think that wasn't possible. And Lloyd George also, I mean, it's uh, because of Lloyd George that we don't have proportional representation because it was the only unanimous <coughs> recommendation of the Speaker's Conference in 1918. The Speaker's Conference in 1918 recommended unanimously um, proportional representation in the urban areas and by a majority of the alternative vote in rural areas. And that was the only unanimous recommendation which Lloyd George's government refused to accept, leading it to a free vote, defeated on the first vote by eight votes. In the late 1920s, he regretted it and said someone should have pointed out to me, but of course it was too late by then. But it's owing to Lloyd George that we don't have proportional representation. Thank you very much. Now, can, I, can we, have we got time for another question? Yes, I yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, just to follow up on that, um, was, I mean, was, was the Liberal Party, the Liberal government on its last legs anyway electorally? Because uh, before the First World War, and in fact, the First World War rather extended its life. Um, out of the 16, uh, there were 16 by elections that the Conservatives won uh, from 1910 to 1914. 15 of them were against the Liberal Party. One was the game for the Labour Party, which was um, George Lansbury's rather quixotic resignation over the female suffrage issue. And working class people, trade unionists and working class people in Bromley, voted against Labour because, not because they were misogynists, but because they said, well, if our wives can all you were talking about married women, when married women were eventually given a vote on the household suffrage basis. Yeah. But if they could get a vote, why can't our sons? It was seen as a class issue, uh, and it was seen as a middle class issue, and in fact was not very popular at all. In fact, it counted against them. And so if there'd been a, if there'd been no First World War, and there'd been a general election neither 1914 or late 1950, which was due. Wouldn't the Conservatives have won that? Bono Law would have become Prime Minister. The only issue to be resolved would have been Ireland, presumably because uh, by that stage it would have got um, a home rule, but there would be no way to enforce it because of the current mutiny. So, and everybody, as you said, agreed that Ulster should be separate. So there would have been an agreement, presumably, similar to that that Bono Law agreed to in 1921. But wouldn't there have been a Conservative government anyway? Well, in all the by-elections, the three-cornered by-elections, Labour was third in all of them. Yeah. And um, I agree with you about uh, the election in Bow, the by-election. You're absolutely right about that. But it was difficult for the Conservatives to win against the Liberals because they'd had to get more seats, not only than the Liberals, but than the Labour Party, which could win seats in Lancashire, which the Liberals couldn't win. Labour had about 40 seats in December 1910, so the Conservatives had to get more seats than the Liberals and more seats plus the 40 from Labour, and also from the Irish Nationalists. Now, Irish Nationalist representation was to be reduced after Hover, I think, to 42. Now, those 42, about 15, I think, would have been from Ulster, so let's say 25. So the Conservatives would have had to get more seats than the Liberals, plus another 65 seats to get a working majority. It's very, very difficult for them. But even if they had, the Liberals would have been the main opposition. They'd have come back later. And there was no sign that the Labour Party was anywhere near overtaking the Liberals. I think myself, the Liberals would have, would have won another election, but who, who knows? But it's very much more difficult for the Conservatives to win than people imagine. Um, as for Ireland, if they had won, they, the Home Rule Party would have been up and going. Ulster would have been out of it. That was agreed. So I don't see, Donald Law couldn't have done anything about it, even if he'd wished. And anyway, he wasn't so much against home rule for Ireland as long as Ulster was excluded. Yeah. Um, I, think, I think the Liberals are doing well on, on, on a roll. <laughs> Richard, can I, can, can, would you like to come in? <clears throat> Sorry. Um, lastly, I really agree with, with Vernon's points on that. So I don't, I don't need to uh, echo everything which he's just said. I mean, we can end on a note of harmony. <laughs> <laughs> You go, you're not allowed to end yet. We're going to have one last question. Uh, <laughs> if you could, you've got the time. Is sure, it? yeah. We, 
Vernon's very keen to hear from a woman. If well, women any... got the vote nearly 100 years ago. <laughs> they don't ask them a question. <laughs> the, the, the lens is pointing at you, but you've got no question. In the, in, in the back there with the glasses, sorry. Um, my question is going to be about PR, and uh, should I, I should declare an interest, David Williams, I believe, of the Content Council, when on two occasions we got 90% of the votes in part the seats, and I'm still believing we are, <laughs> and like the tribal people in the circle of Labour Party, we, we will only get PR, I can hope the S and when the Labour Party or the Conservative Party have nowhere to, else to go, <coughs> coalition or whatever, um, we miss out in But PR isn't just about fairer votes. It's a lot more than that. It's Bernard's book, the book, the presentation of the book, and he will tell you. It's about a different attitude of government. It's about uh, Candidates having to cultivate your votes locally against their own party, whereas other parties so, uh, with SDB. So, um, do you think but, that there is a serious chance in the future of being hard, preferably SDB? <laughs> well, I think the best place to start out is a uh, PR and local government because um, you don't get one party permanently in power at Westminster, but of course you do in a number of local authorities still. And you get it, of course, we've got it now in local government in Scotland and Northern Ireland and Welsh, the Welsh part of Welsh local authorities have the option of choosing it if, if they want. But on your larger question, I have a question to ask you and everyone here. If the Labour, uh, Labour Party is elected next time in a hung parliament, Will the Liberal Democrats insist before supporting it on there being a referendum on proportional representation? That's a question that I can't answer, but perhaps others in this room can. Yeah. <laughs> yes. uh, I know you've got time to ask. Um, I think probably we should end it there. Richard, I am very open to a final contribution from you. Well, just on the proportional representation question, which I'm you know, in favour of, um, I think that if there is going to be another referendum, there will need to be a better effort at selling it than the way, the way it was done last time. I also do think that um, PR in itself is not a kind of magic bullet for all our problems because it will require, as I think has been implied by the question, a kind of a culture shift in terms of how politicians relate to each other. And that the Liberal Democrats, of course, of course, in normal, it's normal in many European countries, uh, such as Germany, to have these long coalition negotiations which precede the government actually taking over and everybody goes into an election. Um, making promises but everybody kind of understands that people are going to have to make compromises and are going to trade and um yeah the liberal democrats got obviously severely burnt after 2010 because they made a coalition agreement uh they dropped uh one of their key pledges which in fact i on principle i'm against what they did on on, on tuition fees uh, but there was you know, no kind of understanding, there was no kind of you know, popular understanding of the kinds of uh, tradings and compromises which might have to be made. And so um, even if they'd made a you know, more sensible set of compromises, I think they still might have ended up getting burned. So now you may well say that the introduction of PR will help bring about that culture shift, and that may be true, but if so, it's still not going to be an instantaneous culture shift. I think all very um, important points. Thank you very much indeed, um, Richard Toy at Exeter and also to Vernon Bognor here. And, and thank you all very much indeed for coming and um, maybe see you in September.